Hi, I'm Dr. Marla Shapiro. I've had the honor of being the president of the North American Menopause Society through 2017, and I sit on the Board of Trustees, and I'm joined by a fellow member on the Board of Trustees, Dr. Stephanie Fabian. Please tell us who you are and what you do. Hi, I'm Dr. Stephanie Fabian, and I am the director of the Office of Women's Health at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and I'm an internist. So, for our clinicians that are out there, our healthcare providers, who are a little bit confused about hormones and breast health, you're here to clear us through that muddle. So, let's first talk about the risk of breast cancer with hormone use. Well, that's a very controversial topic, as you know, and it's probably the thing that women are most concerned yes. about when they start hormone therapy is the breast cancer risk. So the way I explain it to my patients is that uh, the risk associated with estrogen plus a progestogen, and if we're talking about the Women's Health Initiative study, we're specifically talking about conjugated equine estrogens mm -hmm. and medroxyprogesterone acetate as the particular types. And with that combination, so this is women with a uterus, the risk is about um, one extra case per thousand women mm -hmm. of breast cancer, and that starts after about three years of therapy. So it's important to put this risk into context a little bit, and if you compare it to other lifestyle factors, it's about the same as between one and two glasses of wine per day, mm -hmm. um, and about the same as being obese or inactive. So there are some lifestyle factors that are equally important, but nonetheless, the risk exists. Relatively low, though, or relatively rare risk. So now, the inevitable question, is it the same with newer hormone formulations, lower doses, right. transdermals, um, now you know, complexing with a serum, a basidoxephine complex that's now available? Right. Um, there's a lot we don't know still about the different types of estrogens, and it's important to note that if someone is using estrogen alone without a progestogen, mm -hmm. that the risk does not appear to be increased after that five to seven years of use, and even in the longer term follow-up did not appear to be increased. So there does appear to be some differences between progestogens uh, versus estrogen alone. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a lot we don't know yet. Um, some observational studies tell us that there may be differences between different types of progestogens. Um, but there are some unknowns about the types of estrogens and whether that matters. The newer combination of conjugated equine estrogens and basidoxephine does not appear to be increased, associated with increased breast density. Um, so, or breast pain, so that may be a little bit of a different risk, but the studies have only gone out for two years so far, so more to come. More to come. So what about the patient in our office, your office, who is worried because they have family history? We're not talking gene positive yet, but that patient who self-identifies because she has family members that are positive. What type of advice do you give her? So the good news is that we haven't had any studies thus far that have shown that uh, these women have an increased risk beyond their risk associated with a, a family history mm -hmm. associated with hormone therapy use. Now there are some observational studies that show us that estrogen alone may be associated with some increased risk with longer term use, but again, short term use and a woman at higher risk, we don't know of an uh, association that it would increase the risk further than the family history. So good news for them, that yeah. the, often the perception doesn't translate and as a clinician exactly. we can talk about that. Now let's talk about the BRCA positive patient who doesn't have breast cancer, but now obviously is at much greater risk but is really having intractable symptoms. So for the woman with a BRCA mutation who has a lot of symptoms, uh, again, the good news is if she doesn't have a history of breast cancer and if she's had her ovaries removed and is having a lot of symptoms, we don't see an increased risk associated with giving that woman some estrogen therapy at least until the age of 50. So we typically have some hesitations about continuing it beyond that, but again, good news in that at least until the age of 50, there doesn't appear to be excess risk associated right. uh, with adding some estrogen. And who, who sitting across us in an office is an absolute no? A woman with a history of breast cancer is probably an absolute no, except that I would say there are even some very rare caveats where it, it may be a conversation between the doctor and the clinician, but for the most part, we don't give breast cancer survivors any estrogen therapy. And for patients who have a history of hypercoagulability because of protein S or protein C and intractable symptoms, 
is there a rule for a transdermal or are they really got to go down another route? You know, I, th I think there probably is a role for a transdermal preparation. We haven't seen an increased risk of blood clot associated with transdermal preparations at lower doses in observational studies, but that's a conversation about risk and benefit with the patient for sure. So individualization, individualization? Absolutely, as always. Oh, as always. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you.